Every business has a story to tell. From humble beginnings to continuous growth, the possibilities for invigorating tales within a company are endless. But these aren't simple bedtime stories meant to put you to sleep. These are finely crafted narratives that strive to show your business's mission, values, and vision. When executed properly, they can inspire engagement and loyalty. But how can you make these stories inspiring and easily accessible to your employees? This is where a mix of the right tools can make a huge difference. We are embarking on a two-part series covering the tools of the trade. In this episode, we talk to three guests who share their favorite storytelling tools, what challenges they faced, and how you can incorporate these tools into your own methods for sharing your company's story. The Internal Comms Procast is sponsored by Circle. Circle helps personalize your staff newsletter, website, and intranet using the content you're already creating. Let Circle help you tell your company's story to your whole team in a way they'll want to see it. Go to circle.com. That's C-E-R-K-L.com. Circle. Weird spelling. Awesome engagement. Welcome to the Internal Comms Procast. I am your host, Barry Williams. Let's meet our first guest. My name is Elizabeth Raspberry. I work for Cox Communications and I do internal communications for our business services unit. I have a communications background, but I had always done external communications and I had been supporting our business group and they really had a need for internal communications. And we had some personnel changes and I asked the leader that I supported if he he wanted me to shift to do internal. And they were very excited about that. So we just made the changes. So about a year ago, I've been doing this about a year and a half, made the shift from external to internal. When working on a project, it can be easy to fall into a routine of writing information for your audience. However, over 90% of people today are watching YouTube videos. And that number only continues to increase. At least 68% of said viewers are using these videos to help them make daily decisions. Elizabeth saw the potential of making Cox's organizational stories more visual. I was working on a project um, about small business, and I was going to just do the typical go into interview mode and start writing. And I just thought about what I wanted to see, and I said, I would really like to see the business. I would like to see this business, not just read about it. So I asked my boss if I could connect with the field and go shoot some video with my iPhone. And he said, yeah, make it happen. So I did a little bit of research and found some recommendations on some accessories that might help. And I drove out to the site and shot some video. I've been shooting iPhone videos for about a year and a half now. I've done different types. Some I've done with that are more of a news style with different settings. And then I've done some where I've just interviewed a leader in their office. I've done just some conference videos to show people who weren't at a conference what they've missed. So I've gotten a little bit of experience with different types of videos. So some are more package style and some are more B-roll style. It sort of allows me to think about the story and think about what's going to be most compelling. I will say the more you do, the better critique you are, you know, so you're more critical about what is going to make good video. So if it's just some talking heads, I may just decline that because it's not going to be that interesting. I want to think about who are the people that have high energy and are most engaging. And then, you know, just visually what's going to be appealing. So it does sort of make you think about not everything is worthy of a video. Um, So it makes you just think about, you know, what you'd want to see. Sharing a story through video can seem a little daunting at first. You may have dozens of questions, ranging from what equipment to use, to how to make light and sound in your video work just right. Elizabeth shares how she went about making videos on her own and how it's not as complicated as you might think. I would say the challenges are just you know, making sure you've got, um, I would say 
lighting and audio are key. Even though these are sort of DIY videos, you do want them to be the best quality they can be. So, you know, there was one time and it was uh, in like a four-year setting and the audio was just really bad. It just didn't work. So we needed to take the subject to a conference room where we could not have any echoes and things like that. So I would say, you know, thinking about audio is really important. And I try to um, pre-trip as much as I can. So finding out, you know, what room it's going to be in, what's the lighting situation, if it's something outside, what's the weather like that day, is it super windy, you know, all those kind of things as much as you can plan out before. Um, and then I would say for me, the biggest help is, you know, just watching videos, watching TV, watching to see how shots are set up, how, you know, they didn't shoot everything from a far distance. They, they mix things up with medium range and close-ups and wide shots. So kind of thinking like an editor really helps. And then as you're putting together the story, I always say having more is better than not having enough. Um, I shot a vid that sale, a sales conference that I shot. I was with them for probably three or four hours and I just shot everything. I shot them, you know, going on a museum tour and getting off the elevator. I did a time lapse of them getting off the elevator, going down some stairs and into a museum. It was probably maybe a minute long, but then time lapse, of course, collapses that. And then when I was talking to the salespeople, interviewing them about their experience, one of the folks said um, his advice to anyone who gets this opportunity is wear comfortable shoes because there's a lot of walking. So that soundbite matched perfectly with the time lapse. But if I didn't shoot it, it would have it wouldn't have made sense. So I always try to shoot more than I need because you never know when you're putting it together having that. So I would say you know, just doing as much pre-planning, thinking about the end before you begin, you know, all of the elements that you want, and then just shooting more because you can always edit it out at the end. Sharing the stories of the present is a great way to let your audience know what your business is doing today. But if you're in a long established company, you could be sitting on a treasure trove of great stories waiting to be told. Our next guest explains. I'm Lee Friedman from Duke Energy. I work in our corporate communications group. I'm uh, based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm focused on Duke Energy's electric and gas utilities um, in southwest Ohio and northern Kentucky. Um, I'm a, kind of a generalist a from a communication standpoint, you know, employee communications, media relations, speech writing, um, emergency planning and communications. I've been with the company about 10 years. I joined in November of 2009 in 2015. I took a new role with the company and moved up to Cincinnati. Um, and it's been great uh, learning about this and being out in the field and, and uh, meeting and, and learning about all of our employees who really keep, keep everything flowing literally uh, day to day. Duke believes their history is valuable, so much so that the company employs archivists to catalog and maintain a collection of Duke's impact in the communities it serves around the nation. Lee says this archive has proved a valuable resource for some out-of-the-box storytelling. What we know now is Duke Energy, Ohio, and Kentucky, they started, started operating in 1837. So, you know, 182 years ago. So a lot of history um, that's, that's kept in our archive. Um, you know, something that's probably the coolest thing that is, is hard, housed in our archive is actually a cannon. Um, and actually that was used in um, the early 1900s to shoot a transmission power line across a river. Um, so, you know, basically it was the, at the time it was the easiest way to, to restring power lines after a storm or a flood. Um, that was used down in the Carolinas, that cannon. But I just think that's a really kind of a, a cool piece uh, that, that's, that's part of our history that we, that's still around today. But um, it's, it's the archive, it's uh, the employees can tour it if they want. They're trying to put a lot more, um, of their of their collection online and sharing it with employees, but also our customers too via um, our, our website and our brand journalism site. Duke Energy has two employees who 
or full-time employees, but part of the responsibilities are maintaining our archives. They're also uh, involved with our corporate library. Um, and, you know, the archives, which the physical archives are housed in a, in a vault in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. They have about 600,000 photographs documenting uh, Duke Energy's history. And that's just, that's not Duke Energy proper. It's all the companies that are now Duke Energy. So I'm not really a history buff um, per se. I, you know, I've never really been fascinated by history and I've enjoyed reading hist historical uh, uh, novels and, and uh, biographies and things through the years. Um, but for some reason, when I uh, joined uh, Duke Energy's uh, corporate communications team here in Cincinnati four years ago, you know, I was familiar with Duke Energy and some of its history, but I really didn't know much about our local history. And I uh, just kind of just started exploring. Um, and eventually I came, uh, I came to find out that there was an employee newsletter that, that our uh, Cincinnati Gas and Electric, which was a, a predecessor company to Duke Energy, Ohio and Kentucky, they published from the 1920s um, up until about 1994. And uh, there are the copies kept in our corporate archive, and I was able to pull stories here or there if I needed something. For instance, you know, if we had a, a few years ago, we had some major flooding in Cincinnati, you know, high water levels in the Ohio River. And I knew for a fact that, you know, um, back in the, I believe the 70s, there was some major flooding too. So I was able to pull some archives um, or ask our archivists to pull some articles from that employee newsletter. And it got to a point, um, I don't know if they were annoyed by me or they just wanted to enable me some more. They had a bunch of extra copies of the of these uh, employee newsletters, and they sent me a, a batch of them. So I have uh, two huge files uh, boxes at my desk. Um, there's only a partial collection, but I'm able to pull uh, article or look through articles uh, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s um, to use in uh, to in our in internal communications, external communications, but also just to browse for some story ideas um, as I develop some uh, external and internal uh, stories to share with our employees and our other uh, customers and stakeholders. For companies wanting to start their own archives, the task may seem a bit overwhelming. Lee says communicators should start by doing what they do best, asking questions. Well, I think a lot of people, when they're, when they think about accessing historical records from their company or their organization. It's, you know, where do I start? And I think the easiest way to start is just asking questions. Um, finding an employee or employees who've been around for a while, um, you know, asking them about certain aspects of the company history or if they have any do historical documents, things like that. I'm really lucky that Duke Energy, one, has been around for a long time, but two, has a corporate archives department that has been very helpful. Um, the two people that kind of manage the archives among some other responsibilities, they're just fantastic to work with. But I've also, you know, not just relied on them. I've, I've used the local library and they have uh, free resources that I can use to access old newspaper articles and read about, um, you know, locally read the old uh, Cincinnati Inquirer and the other newspaper that's no longer in existence and the old articles about our company um, and using those as a resource to come up with story ideas. Coming up on the Internal Comms Procast, our third guest shares how he created a living social network inside his organization. Internal Comms Pro is proud to present the Rise and Shine series, coming to a city near you. Engaging and energizing, Rise and Shine events are designed with the IC Pro in mind. A featured speaker kicks off the event with a talk about the most current strategies, tools, and best practices. Then a panel of experts shares how they apply the speaker's topic in their own organizations. You will leave with new ideas you can actually implement the next day. See where we are going to be next and join the fun at internalcomspro.com slash shine. Welcome back. Storytelling in a large, dispersed organization can create a unique set of challenges. Your stories need to reach across location, generations, and titles to make an impact on your employees. Our final guest shares a storytelling tool that is centered around exactly that. I'm John Twombly. I'm a senior consultant in communications marketing at St. Louis Children's Hospital. We have about 3,500 employees at St. Louis Children's Hospital. 
and we have a few hundred of those at some off-site locations. We have about eight off-site locations throughout the St. Louis area. So our biggest challenges, number one, is that about two-thirds of our staff uh, are deskless. They're on the move during the day. Uh, they do have uh, devices or shared computers in a lot of cases. They do have email addresses, about 90% of them do. Um, and, and our click-through rate for our email communication has been good. It's topped a national healthcare benchmark for the past three years. So I don't see access as a problem. Uh, our employees are highly engaged uh, and we get ton tons of comments uh, posted as well, especially when we compare it to the rate of other BJC hospitals. Um, our physicians are not our employees, like I said earlier, so that represents a big challenge. Uh, they are employed by Washington University. So when we roll out something, often the question, the immediate question is, what about our physicians? And they have three roles, not just the clinical care that they're engaged in, but also teaching and research. And so their institution has some different priorities and objectives that dovetail ours, but are not identical to ours. And so it's important that we recognize and respect unique needs and responsibilities for people from each institution, but also have a partnership there. So that is definitely a, a challenge that we have. To help solve this issue, St. Louis Children's Hospital decided to adopt a platform to allow their employees to communicate. Workplace by Facebook. John explains. So Workplace is a secure employee social network that resembles the external Facebook, uh, which as we know has about 2.4 billion users worldwide. And because the platforms are so similar, uh, adoption is easier and more intuitive for employees. Uh, at the same time, we have to educate people that it is separate from regular Facebook and that it requires a separate login. You don't need to have a regular external Facebook login to use it and you don't need to have a Facebook account. And also something that's very important is that when different departments use regular Facebook for private groups, all that information belongs to Facebook, not our organization. When we use Workplace, the information belongs to our organization, BJC. Uh, we adopted Workplace early in 2018, and it's very similar to Yammer, which comes with Office 365. It's another employee social network. Well, when I first got into this profession uh, decades ago, there was no such thing as digital. Uh, in fact, uh, my very first job in this career, there was no such thing as email in our organization. There was such a thing as email that had been invented in the 1980s, but we didn't have it. Uh, everything, just about everything was print. If you wanted video, you would call in a firm that would cost thousands of dollars and they'd probably bring in at least half a dozen people to shoot a video, so it was a big deal. Um, and my nightmare at that time always centered on whether I would have enough content to fill a print publication. Uh, so that was the, the situation back then. And today it's way different because the challenge is we have so many stories in this hospital that we have an overabundance of options. And so our challenge is to find what will resonate the best with our organization, with our people. And we often can fine tune that by looking at our analytics and making sure things are resonating with them and listening to them. Uh, so uh, with that overabundance, the number one, uh, the challenge is cadence. The number one point of employee survey feedback that we have is we're at work, we're busy, we don't have time, get to the point. So it's critical that we give bite-sized content that's easy to digest and that we grab people's attention through photos and headlines and links and, and not putting all the text on the front page. Uh, we normally avoid laying out all that regular text in any medium like newsletters, announcements, and screensavers. Less is more. The more words we use, the less impact each word has. So the point I'm making about uh, too much great content here is that one person 
can't just do it all. We have too many great stories. So we need to have a close partnership with in external communication and, and marketing as, as well as internal communication. And we need to enable people across the hospital to contribute content and story ideas. And we need to repurpose or repackage the best content to get the most mileage out of it. Well, the chief benefit or thing we try to sell to employees and leaders about this is that it extends the stories or recognition beyond just the team, just the department team or the walls of that department. Um, in our case, people elsewhere in the hospital may see such stories and thousands of people elsewhere in BJC Healthcare can see it. So it really um, gives added exposure. It raises the profile of the story or recognition, possibly making it more meaningful to the person being recognized, for instance. It cuts across silos of knowledge sharing among departments or institutions. Uh, and finally, it broadens people's networks. And this is really important because people come in each day and they're familiar with the people within the walls of their department. But if they engage with workplace, they will soon be regularly seeing the presence of others and connecting with them. So they broaden their network uh, because anyone uh, can see who has seen a post and connect with those people. One, what are we trying to achieve? Two, what do we want people to do? And finally, three, how can we measure where we are now at point A and later after communicating for a certain amount of time, where are we at point B? Are we reaching our goal? And it's a very uh, multimedia intensive uh, visual approach uh, because these days, uh, People have so many other distractions that the, the number one most important thing we can do is attract their attention. We want to thank all of our guests for joining us on this episode. Next time on the Internal Comms Procast, part two of our Tools of the Trade series. It was one of our most popular articles on Internal Comms Pro. Why Intranets Fail. We spoke to three experts about the ways intranets fail and what communicators can do about it. So in my experience, intranets tend to fail because organizations typically look at them as a solution when in reality, they are simply a tool or an enabler of a solution. Internal Comms Procast is produced by Super Awesome Media. This episode was written and edited by Gina Morvec. Our theme music is Please Listen Carefully by Jazzer via the Free Music Archive. Our intro music is Sea of Glass by Connor Sweeney. Thank you for listening.